All right, uh, we've been in a series, and in fact, this is part three of a little series that we're just calling Forces. Uh, uh, first week, we talked about beware of uh, false feelings, the force of feelings. Uh, last week, we talked about beware of uh, false beliefs, because how, how many of you know beliefs um, can affect your, your course in life, and uh, you can have wrong beliefs, and uh, Today, we're going to talk about the force um, or beware of false relationships. Beware of false relationships. Galatians chapter 4, we'll have it up here on the screen in case you need to reference it. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8, this has been the foundational text through this series. It says, starts in verse number 8, it says, This time of year, uh, excuse me, it says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God. Now that, that makes more sense, doesn't it? How is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Well, who can answer that question? No. no way, right? Skip down to verse number uh, 19. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth, until Christ is, notice this word, formed in you. So we've already identified that, that Christ's likeness doesn't just happen automatically. In other words, the moment you are saved, the moment you receive Christ as your Savior, you're what we call born again. The old has passed away, all things have become new. But Christ's likeness doesn't all happen in a moment. There are, there are things that you bring into your new journey, your faith walk with you, things that you bring into that from the past. Uh, and there are, there are things that God begins to go to work in you. In other words, you, you, don't, you don't walk down an aisle, get saved, and then walk back to the aisle, and everybody notices like there's a little halo above your head, right? There's issues because you, you've got issues. I know because I see it from where I'm standing right now. You all have issues. Some of your issues have baby issues. <laughs> like you got, like you got generations of issues going on. I get that, right? Uh, so, uh, but but Christ likeness is a process. It begins to be developed. Glory, f- from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from from uh, thought by thought, habit by habit. Think, think about it like this. Your life is a gift from God. And what you do with it is your gift back to him. You get that? Can we say amen and just go home after that? And that's good, right? Tweet that, by the way, somebody, okay? So, so this, this, is, this, is kind of, this is kind of what we're talking about. So it's, but there's a process. And the thing that tries to work against the process of becoming Christ-like or being formed like him are these weak and miserable forces, these things that try to draw on you and pull you back to your old way of thinking, the, the habits of your past, the, the failures of your past, right? That try to be, make those things the, the dominant patterns and thoughts of your life. Okay, you, you get that. I, I, was, I was just noticing that... Uh, like, here we are at the end of October, and if, 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 if you notice, like me, that you can't even turn on the television without seeing some kind, some kind of thriller show on TV, you notice that? Like, every channel, thriller, 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 because, because the holiday season or the, the time of year that we're in, uh, and, and particularly vampire shows. You ever notice that? Like, this time of year, like, what is up with our generation that we are so obsessed uh, with vampires, uh, I mean, you, I, the other day I was turning on the TV. It's like vampire show. Turn the channel, vampire show. T- channel, vampire. Vamp- t- channel, vampire, right? It's just there's, there's something about our generation. We've got uh, uh, vampire diaries. There's Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, you've got uh, Vampire Country Club. American Idol Vampire Edition. Dancing with the Vampires. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Uh, Twilight Eclipse. Twilight 
you know, uh, twilight, new moon, half moon, twilight, breaking dawn, twilight, breaking dawn two, twilight, breaking dawn three, four, five. Like what's up with like how many vampire shows does one generation need? Talk to me, somebody. Right. I, I wish. Are you is anybody like me to just wish Hollywood would just like like what's up with these new school vampires too? these new school vampires, you know, they've got they've been to the tanning salon. They got their teeth whitened. They're wearing Louis Vuitton. They got Oakley glasses on. They're sipping frappuccinos at the club. They're talking about their feelings and girl, you don't even know. Right. I, I just wish Hollywood would do us all a favor and go back to old school Dracula. How many know what I'm talking about? Like with a big, ugly cape. Like once a year, right? You, you, you want to know why we, don't have, we didn't have all those vampire shows back in the day? Because Dracula came in once a year, one show a year, ate everybody with his big ugly cape, and then left, right? Swoop in one time a year, eat everybody, see you next year. But I, I know, I know we, we, we joke a little bit, but here, here's the truth this morning, that we've all been affected by some of those relational vampires, these are, these are people who show up in our lives to drain our joy, steal our energy, rob us of our peace, get on our last nerve. That's why you need to pray for power connections to come into your life. Power connections, a power connection is God blessing you for transition. In other words, when God wants you to, to take you from one season in your life to another season, he'll often send these power relationships into your path. These are people who most of the time or, or oftentimes have already gone through what you're in the process of going through. Or they've already arrived at where you're trying to get to. And now they have the, this divine ability to reach backwards, grab you, and pull you forward and further than you ever could on your own without them. On the other hand, some people have the opposite effect. Rather than pulling you forward, they block your progress. Uh, they become, maybe they're good people, but they've, unawares many times, have become weak and miserable forces that keep you blocked, squelched in your progress, that keep your purpose below what you are called to, 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 to be a part of. Uh, that's why we need to pray for 2020 uh, discernment. Uh, 2020 discernment. Uh, it's in, in the scriptures. It, I think I even talked about this here not long ago. There is a, there's a man in the Bible in the New Testament by the name of Zechariah. Zechariah had a wife named Elizabeth. These were good people. They were godly people. They honored God. In fact, the scripture says that they were righteous in the eyes of the Lord. This is a power couple. Uh, but of all they're getting, everything that they received, all, these were blessed people, but they lacked one thing. They were unable to have a child. Uh, she was barren. Elizabeth wasn't able to have children. And now that she's way beyond the age of childbearing, it felt like that window of opportunity was closed down for them. And you got to understand that in those days, there was a, uh, a, a status symbol that was applied to any family who weren't able to have children. It, it was a serious matter. One day, the angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah. And he said, listen, your wife Elizabeth is going to become pregnant and she's going to have a son, and you're going to name him John. Of course, we know it was John the Baptist. The angel went on to say that this baby is going to become, grow up and become the forerunner to the Messiah, right? Prepare the way for the Messiah. I want you to jump forward with me now about six months later. She's now pregnant, six months into it, right? And uh, an angel shows up to another young lady. Her name is Mary pretty much gives her the same speech, only this time it's not the forerunner, this is the Messiah. You're going to have Mary, you're going to have a baby. You're, you're going to become pregnant. She says, I'm a virgin, this can't be. He said, well, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And you, you, know, the, you know the scriptures. You're going to give birth to the Son of God. Well, you can imagine Mary after this visitation from the angel. She needs to tell somebody. How do you hold that kind of excitement in? But who's going to believe her? Like, I'm pregnant, 
Never been with a man, I'm a virgin. It must be because God did it. I mean, who's going to believe that? There's one person in her life that she knows that she can confide in. This is a power connection. Her name is Elizabeth. They're related. Mary, the Bible says, gathers her things, and she moves uh, heads to the hill country near Judea. There she sees Elizabeth's house. She comes up to the house, and your Bible says that when, Ma- when Mary approached the house of Elizabeth, she greeted Elizabeth. Now, it doesn't say that she began to read from Isaiah chapter 53. And it doesn't say that she quoted the four spiritual laws to to Elizabeth. It doesn't even say that she pulled out anointing oil and poured it over Elizabeth's head and began to anoint her. All she did was say, hi, Elizabeth, I'm here. Hi, how you doing? And your Bible says that the baby inside of Elizabeth leaped in her womb. Now, I want you to think about that. The baby leaped in her womb. Apostle Paul says it like this in 2 Corinthians 5, no, no man after the flesh. What strange language. He was saying, in effect, uh, nobody comes to you with just their physical presence. Someone who comes into your scene always brings a spirit with them. There are flesh people, and then there are spirit people, right? Someone's going to bring something into your atmosphere, He goes on in in Romans chapter 8, verse 5. He says it like this. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Think about it like this. Flesh people feed your fear. Faith people or spirit people feed your faith. Flesh people will drain you of your energy. They can be a vampire. Right? Spirit people, on the other hand, will add to your strength. Flesh people will uh, distract you. They'll put you down. They'll, they'll chop you down, while spirit people will build you up. Flesh people will point you to your past. They'll remind you how big your giants are. They'll, they'll cause you to wander for 40 more years in the wilderness. Spirit people, however, just by getting around them will cause that baby, that dream to leap on the inside of you. Are you catching what I'm saying uh, this morning? Remember, just because someone is with you doesn't mean they're for you. Just because someone is in your space doesn't mean they're on the same path. I have decided that I am not going to have ongoing fellowship with critical, grouchy, angry, uncommitted people whose sky is always falling. At some point, you have got to clear a way for the God-appointed assignments, those power connections, to come into your life. Well, power, Pastor Doug, what if, what, what, what if I hurt their feelings? What, what if they steer you away from your destiny? Well, 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 Pastor Doug, you know, what if I make a change and, and I, I lose a friend or you know, I be, I be, I, I'm alone now, you know, I, I'm going to have to move to a bayou in Louisiana called Bayou Self. Like, like what happens, right? It may happen. Listen to me this morning. That could happen for a season, but could I tell you something? You will never give up something for God that he doesn't give you something better back in return. I had a friend many years ago when our, when our kids were very young, and, and uh, he and I used to hang out together. And, and you know what? Really, thinking back on it, he was very good to me. And uh, we used to spend some time together. And, and even though he was really good to me, he became more and more critical with each passing month. He started complaining about everything. And uh, it goes to show you that just because someone is good to you doesn't mean that they are good for you. Tweet that, by the way, okay? All right? He was really good, but, but he, was compl- he, he found fault in everything. That critical spirit in him began to rise up and, sh- and rear its ugly head everywhere. He w- we would have an event at church, and afterwards, he would give me this big, long list of everything that went wrong with the event. 
We'd go out to lunch or out to eat, and his, his meal would be returned two or three times in order for them to get it right. He'd walk into a room, and he'd pick apart everything and find something wrong with everything. He was just a really negative guy, and every one of our conversations began to turn to how bad it's going on in society and how bad the government is, and we're all about to go to hell in a handbasket. And finally, I got to a point where every time we would leave each other and I'd be on the way home, I'd feel more depressed than ever because he was very convincing. Like I reminded of that guy who was about ready to jump off a bridge, right? Some guy saw him driving by and stopped a car, ran over there and said, don't jump, don't jump. Listen, just give me some, give me some time. Let's just talk about it. Two hours later, they both jumped off. I mean, <laughs> these kind of things, you know what I'm talking about, Okay. This is, this is what it was with this guy. He was good to me, but yet I, I had to make a hard decision. Like the more I tried to turn his attitude, speak into his life, encourage him, nothing was happening. It was, it was actually getting worse and worse and worse. Finally, I had to make that tough choice. I had to remove him from my inner circle. Doesn't mean I wasn't nice to him anymore. It doesn't mean I didn't take his calls. I still continued to encourage him, pray with him, but he was no longer in a position to speak into my heart and to influence my soul. The scripture says it like this, as iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens another. We need to make fellowship with people who can keep us sharp because those who are not sharpening you up will eventually dull you down. Listen to me this morning. You need to look around at those who are in your inner circle. If you are always the most encouraging person in your circle, if you are always the, the biggest faith-filled person in your circle, can I tell you something? It means your circle is too small. I'm telling you something this morning. As you grow, some people will not want you to go farther. They'll want to keep you at the level that they're at. But listen to me this morning. Remember, those who don't increase you, they will eventually decrease you. You know, I, I was reading through the scriptures, and it's interesting how uh, throughout the Bible, believers are often referred to as eagles. You know, we, we talk about that. Like, that there's that, that's that great scripture that says that we are sheltered under his mighty wings. It's a picture of that great eagle, and we're sheltered under that. Isaiah, the prophet, wrote it like this. He says that uh, we will mount up with wings as eagles. What's so significant about an eagle? Eagles are able to fly higher than most other birds. They're not able to get to the highest altitudes as some other birds, but they've been spotted at over 20,000 feet in the air. Would you think about that? I also read where the crow is a natural enemy and pest to the eagle. And even though the eagle is much bigger and more powerful than the crow, the crow is actually more agile than the eagle. So what the crow does is just to annoy the eagle, it'll fly right behind the eagle, just, just pecking at it, just, just chasing the eagle. Of course, the eagle can certainly turn around and start to fight and create this, this uh, you know, mid-air uh, avionic you know, uh, warfare up there, up there in the atmosphere. But the eagle knows, right? If he, when the eagle decides that he's tired of the crow, all he has to do, he, he doesn't have to outmaneuver the, the crow. All he has to do is rise higher and higher and higher. The eagle knows that it can go where the crow cannot go. And he knows that eventually he'll just fall away. This is what almost happened uh, in David's life. Uh, there, there's always going to be some crows in your life. You may, you may work with crows. You, you, you may have neighbors that are crows. You might be sitting by a crow. If you're the only one not laughing. Listen, you can't stop crows from crowing. But how many know you can decide to spread your wings and fly higher and higher? Like in the natural, we all want to turn and fight, get even, spend all of our emotional energy hovering at their level. But listen, if you're not careful, pretty soon you'll be comfortable at the level that the crow flies in. You'll start, you'll start squawking like a crow. You'll start digging around in a garbage can like a crow. You'll start getting quarrelsome like a crow. 
trying to, trying to fight all the time like the crow, scavenge like the crow, even though you've been made into an eagle. I told you this is, this is what almost happened with, with David. Uh, David uh, had a group of guys that we call the mighty warriors of David. They were soldiers, several hundred of them. And uh, the Bible says that this was the time when David was running from King Saul. Uh, David was already anointed to be king of Israel because God had already had him anointed. So the position was his, but Saul was, uh, he, he wasn't re- relenting the throne. He was, he was fighting David over his space. And so David and his men were actually in the countryside. Uh, they set up camp right outside of a large farm. Uh, the farm was owned by a man by the name of uh, Nabal. Nabal was a very wealthy man. He was extremely rich. He owned a lot of land. He owned cattle. He owned sheep, a lot of livestock. But the Bible says that Nabal was a very mean man. He was, uh, uh, he was uh, surly. He, he, he was dishonest. He was very difficult to get, get, to get along with. Well, well, David and his men were camped out just outside of Nabal's farm and his property. And just because their presence, they were actually protecting Nabal's house, Nabal's family, and Nabal's property. Like you think about it, nobody dared to go steal from Nabal or do take anything from his property or do anything to Nabal's family while David and his soldiers were camped right outside there. You you might say that Nabal was getting free, like security, armed security, night and day. Well, it came time for harvest time. And so David sent a message to Nabal saying, hey, listen, uh, you know, we've been protecting you. We've been protecting your family. had not asked for anything in return. Not one of my men have st- stolen anything from you. We've, we've honored you, your family, and your property. But David said, we'd like you, since it's harvest time, to donate some of your animals for us. They, they, they're looking for some food. And uh, you would think that Nabal would have been grateful but instead of being grateful, <laughs> Nabal said it like this in, in 1 Samuel chapter 25, beginning in verse number 10. Who is this fellow David? Now, he already knows the answer to that. Look at the next line. Who does this son of Jesse think he is? Verse 11. Should I take my bread and my water and my meat that I've slaughtered for my shearers and give it to a band of outlaws who come from who knows where? When that message got back to David, the Tabasco sauce rose all the way to the top. Like he was fuming. David didn't start singing the song of the psalm that he had written. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. No other words started formulating in his mouth. Mama say, mama saw, mama saw. <laughs> mama say, mama saw, mama, woo-hoo. Like, I don't know. Some other words begin to form right in his mouth. And, and, and David, David turned to his guys and said, hey, boys, get your swords. Let's go pay Mr. Nabal a visit. He wasn't joking around. In fact, David said this uh, in verse number 21 of 1 Samuel 25. A lot of good it did to help this guy. We protected his flocks in the wilderness, and nothing he owned was lost or stolen. He has repaid me evil for, for good. 22, verse 22, may God strike me and kill me if even one man of his household is still alive tomorrow morning. You, you can almost see the veins popping out in David's forehead, like one hand on a sword, just looking in Nabal's direction. I'll be your huckleberry. Like, I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's just like the guy's like so serious, right? And yes, there are times when we have to take a stand and fight. David fought Goliath. But please hear me, Cross Hill. We have to make sure that the battle is between us and our destiny. Otherwise, it's just a distraction. David and his men were on their way to Nabal's house, about ready to make a a, a major error in in, in their destination. Nabal's wife uh, was 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 a lady by the name of Abigail. She was a godly woman. She was a very wise woman. When she heard that David was on his way, the Bible says that she took 200 loaves of bread. She prepared cakes and took wine and went out to meet David. When she saw David coming, 
The Bible says that she bowed down low. She looked up and said, David, my husband is a fool. How many of you ladies ever thought about putting that on your coffee mug? No? Like, like on one side of the mug, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Just flip it around. My husband is a fool. Just start my day with the word. Just start. I'm sorry. I had to, I had to go there, right? She said, she said, David, my husband is a fool. She, she went on. She said, he, he's, he's hot-headed. Short te- he's, he's short-tempered. He can't get along with anybody. What was she saying? He's nothing but a vampire. He's a crow. Why are you wasting your energy on this guy? She, she went on to say this uh, in verse number 30. She said, when the Lord has done all that he has promised, she said, first of all, David, you are going to be the king of Israel. Why would you even fight this fool? And then she goes on, she says, when the Lord has done all he has promised and has made you leader of Israel, don't let this be a blemish on your record. She was saying, in effect, remember who you are. You're an eagle. Remember who you are. Why are you trying to hover at the same level as a crow? David came to his senses. Verse 32, David replied to Abigail, Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you to meet me today. Thank God for your good sense. Bless you for keeping me from murder and from carrying out vengeance. Look at this next line. With my own hands. In other words, I was about to fight a battle that didn't even belong to me. What's my point today? There's always going to be navels that show up in your life. There's always going to become some relational spiritual vampires that show up. There's always going to be those crows that show up unannounced and unexpected. Don't, don't get baited into conflicts that have nothing to do with your destiny. Don't allow yourself to get distracted and pulled back by those weak and those miserable forces. The Bible says that Abigail went back and told her husband what had happened. David had a change of heart. She told him everything that she had done, how she prepared the meal and confronted David. The Bible says when when Nabal heard what his wife had done, that he had a heart attack instantly. Ten days later, he died. Not only was she a godly, wise woman, but she was a very beautiful woman. And David wasted no time. (laughs) He sent a note to her. (laughs) This is kind of like third grade style, but he sent a note to her and said, would you be my wife? And she she agreed to be his wife. What's my point? When, God, when you let God fight your battles, you'll always come off better than you were before. It doesn't mean that you're going to get an extra wife. But it will mean that he's going to make it up to you. What, what, what am I saying? I'm, saying? I'm saying this morning that when the right person showed up in David's life at the right time, and when he recognized this divine connection... If he had not recognized this power connection at the right time, it could have affected his entire destiny. I'm saying to you today, remember, God will always give you the right people at the right time to accomplish the purpose that he's placed on your life. I heard someone say it like this. Look around at the five closest people in your life. Do you think about that right now? Think about the five closest people in your life. That's you. That's you. You are right now the sum total of all of your relationships up to this point. What am I saying today? I'm saying simply I showed up on week three of Miserable Forces series to challenge you and tell you to get the boldness and the audacity and the faith to say goodbye to some people so that you can say hello to the people that God has designed you to do life with. You got to clear the way. Come on, Cross Hill. You got to clear the way for God assignments in your life. Father, I I wanna thank you today for the word that, that you've given to us. I ask God that you will 
just speak this message into the hearts of people. Relationships are so powerful. Relationships, we know God can be the greatest thing for our life and they can be the worst thing for our life. They can propel us and they, be, they can become miserable forces. I ask God that you will give us 2020 discernment to, to trust you and rely on you to surround ourselves with godly connections, to, to not undervalue meeting together as, as, as a faith-filled body of believers, to not look at something like church or fellowship gatherings of faith and, and discount the value and the importance of that. I thank you, Father God. Look, look up at me here for a moment. I, 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 just, I just heard this right now because I, I can just, I could feel some of you like, this is not easy, you know? This is not easy. I get it. I really do. But can I tell you that for, for every negative Nancy that walks away from your life, God has a faith-filled Pharaoh to take her place. But it takes, honest, honest to goodness, it takes literally surrendering your desires over to his desires. You don't just go to church somewhere. You don't just say, ah, there's, there's something, I think I'll go there. And maybe, maybe if you're looking for a place, I get it, there's always that beginning stage, but you don't just show up just to be showing up to check the weekly box. God's placed assignments on your life. You haven't, you, as a family, as a couple, we've got married couples here, there's an assignment that you have. God, God's placed assignments on your life. I know we're always looking for those power connections, but maybe you are the power connection. Right? Maybe you're the Abigail that someone right across the aisle has been praying for. Don't discount those God connections in your life. I know sometimes we get so busy looking for the upper hand that we forget to open up our hand. We getting too deep now? Stop preaching, start telling the truth. Get it? All right? Come on, guys. Come on, trust him for this. He's got this, okay? He's got this. Doesn't mean it doesn't mean you gotta be rude. Doesn't mean you have to shun. It doesn't mean you gotta, you know, all it just mean it just it just means you you, you gotta you gotta make sure that his agenda is first in every plan that you do. That, that God's word and his agenda is is literally leading your decisions in life. What 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 would Jesus do, right? I know we put that on a bracelet, but it's real. What would he do? What would he do? What would he say to me? In fact, I, that's what I want you to do right now. I want you to close your eyes. Just, just close your eyes right where you're at. And I want you to, I want you to pray this prayer. Well, I, actually, I want you to ask yourself this question. What is God saying to me through this message today? Just take a moment. Now with your, with your eyes still closed, I want you to make that a prayer. Just ask, ask him, say, say Lord, what, what, are you, what are you saying to me through this message? Father, we give you thanks today. We honor you and give you praise. Blessed Lord, thank you, God. While you're praying right now, I just want to look up at that camera and maybe someone in the room, if you have not received Jesus as your personal Savior, or maybe at one point in your life, like you had this connection with the Lord and you were serving, whatever whatever it is, and some, somehow you felt yourself begin to drift, you know? Like that connection with God has just become tainted because of life has just bombarded you for whatever reason. And really, the reasons don't matter. It's just you're in this place now where you don't feel as, as close to, to the Lord. Your relationship has been... Has, has, has taken a hit. And if that's you, or maybe you've never, ever once received Jesus as your personal Savior, listen, this could be the greatest day of your life right here. I simply want you to uh, say this prayer out loud after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask that you forgive me of all my sin. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I surrender my whole life to you right now. All that I am and all that I have belongs to you. God, lead me, guide me, take my life. In Jesus' name, amen.
and amen. Listen, if you prayed that very simple prayer, we believe you got born again today. We have something we want to give you. Uh, so if you're here in service, make sure you see us afterwards. we got something we want to send you off on your journey with. If you're watching online, do me a favor, will you please click on the comment link. Say, Pastor Doug, that was me. I raised my hand right there in my living room. We have something we want to send you to. God bless you guys. Will you guys do me one more favor, please? Will you turn around and tell two or three people how glad you were to see them in God's house today? God bless you.